proud of the old siding by the thickness of the sheeting. Thank you in advance for any advice your group is willing to share. Rob. No, so Rob no, you've mean... got to do it the way the house is built. And of course, if you put a layer of sheeting there, that's going to be proud of the existing siding. Boom. Next question. <laughs> Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building assemblies, air sealing, and wet basements aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. I'm joined by Rob Wadzak, Digital Brand Manager. Good morning. Kylie Jacques, Design Editor. Hello. And our fearless producer, Jeff Rose. Howdy. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast and totten.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, once again, it is the pleasure, a pleasure to be with you all. It is the highlight of my week. How is everybody? Good. I'm surprised Good. to hear you say that given how many podcasts you do in a week now. <laughs> well, if I didn't do this, I'd have to do real work. So this seems like an <laughs> ideal solution for me. You know, you know, Patrick, sometimes I forget that I haven't seen you in person in months. And in fact, I was driving through Newtown the other day and I was like, huh, I should stop by Patrick's house. Why didn't you? I don't know. It was a little out of the way. <laughs> well, you're welcome anytime, Rob. There's always projects to do, buddy. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of projects, I think we should do that before we get to listener feedback, just for a little deviation in the routine. Kylie, what have you been doing? Well, I think you should start with Rob. He's got the most exciting thing going on. I got a little something to add, but Rob's project is pretty sweet. Let's go there. Okay. I do. What have okay. you been doing, Rob? Oh, I've been hustling to try to get the back deck on my barn done. I mean, there was a little deck there to begin with. I know I, I talked about this before. And I, I'm kind of framing it in, in a lot of ways similar to the uh, the woodshed I built for Kylie in, yeah. that, in that it has three beams going out to posts and then the rafters are running, uh, sort of, if you want to call them that, more like purlins, I purlins. guess, running horizontally to hold the two by four purlins, basically to hold the metal roof up. And um, so you're talking I, about, so you you framed uh, a porch roof on on the deck. The deck is done, but now you're adding a roof. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. Yeah, so I've I've it's only a four foot, five foot deep deck, and it runs the length of my little sixteen foot long barn, and. Um, it's perched high up in the trees, so I'll have a beautiful view of the river once it's done. How high is that, Rob? It looks kind of scary. <laughs> so from the deck to the ground just below it is probably 10, 12 feet. But then if you if you took a good running leap, you could drop probably about 40 feet to the, down, the bottom of the hill. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> I love that corrugated roof metal. You're, uh, th you're going to love that. In the oh, I know. Rain. We, in the rain, that's going to be so sweet. Yes. I hear, I hear mine just from my window, my bedroom window. I like it. I like that. Yep, our side porch. In fact, every every roof except for the main roof of my house is is metal. I just love the, the metal roofing. It's just yeah. so easy to install, lasts forever, and like you said, it sounds great. Rob, Tell me, Rob, is that kind of, is that sorry. new or did you salvage that from somewhere? We bought those. They were exactly the right length. They were six feet long for my little deck with a little bit of an overhang. Um, we bought those probably 20 years ago to build a fence. And then we thought that living in a neighborhood, maybe a corrugated shiny metal fence wasn't exactly <laughs> nice for our neighbors. <laughs> Unless you're running a drug cartel, I would say that's probably true. <laughs> it was going to be an architectural, you know, focal point kind of thing. It wasn't. That's like what the it. drug cartels say. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to be your signature look. you got a style going. Yeah, for sure. So how close are you being uh, to being done with this little project? Uh, probably one or two more evenings after work. I could wrap it up. Cool. Do you, so. do you anticipate, um, is that going to be like your man hangout or is that for the family? So <laughs> my barn has been many different things over the years. It started out, uh, the upstairs was going to be a wood shop. Downstairs was going to be my metal shop, which is true. But then for years, the upstairs actually had a pool table in it that just, oh, fit, yeah. that just fit in there. And I, we only used it a couple of times a year. So I got rid of it. All, all my neighbors cried. <laughs> and, right, because uh, they, they want you to have a pool table so that yeah. they can use it. And they don't want to have a pool yeah, table because like, they don't want to give like, up the space. I said, hey, I know one of my neighbors has an extra dining room in his house because it used to be a two-family house. I'm like, you can put it in there if you want. Oh, I don't have room for it. Okay, fine. <laughs> so... Uh, 
But then uh, now the upstairs of my barn is still a wood shop, but I made it so that all my woodworking tools and materials store flat against one wall when they're not in use. So the room is just wide open, 15 feet by 18 feet inside. And it's actually where my daughter does her fencing, remote fencing oh, classes. That's cool. Yeah. Her cool. remote fencing. God, things are so strange. <laughs> but but it's, yeah, it's going to be a multi-purpose. The, the, the deck will be both, um, a place to hang out. And I think it'll be a, a regular spot for me to hang out. And then at the same time, I can roll my lathe out there when I want to do or, or, or my, you know, do sanding or whatever, any dusty work that I want to do, I can do out there and just let the chips fall. That's awesome. Cool. How about you, Jeff? What have you been doing? Um, not a whole lot. Um, my, my wife answered an ad on Craigslist for some, uh, tongue and groove, dug for flooring for our front porch because I need to replace some boards and went and picked that up. It turns out most of it was not dug fur. It was actually some sort of hardwood, to- mm. tropical hardwood. Interesting. Not as hard as y- y- like pay, a nicer wood? Well, yeah. Uh, it's just going to be, I'm going to have to do something else with it. Mm-hmm. I think I'm going to try and make a uh, porch swing. Cool. Cool. Nice. So was this something someone was trying to get rid of for from a remodeling project? Yeah, he was he was redoing the whole porch. He had done some repairs to it a few, like five years ago, and now more of it needed to be worked on. So he was just ripping the whole thing out and replacing it. Did you get Do you guys deal? look routinely for that kind of stuff on Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace? Um, I, I think my wife cruises uh, mm-hmm. Craigslist free section quite a bit. <laughs> what else That's have you cool. gotten that way? Uh, we got a whole bunch of uh tongue and groove cedar one year wow yeah um somebody had again ripped out a porch you know a, a, a three season porch and um a bunch of things eh? cool yeah some some what planters. about you kylie oh well i i've just been working in my garden so nobody cares about that but i have a product <laughs> review okay you see this? remember when i bought this patrick this yes is my it, it is your anti-covid grabber right that I was so geeked out on. You should tell and, folks what it is and yeah, what it looks so it's, like. It's made of brass. It should be, from what I've read since I've been bamboozled, I think it should be <laughs> for, you know, pure copper. I think it would be more effective that way. But I'm interested in learning so about... So we should tell folks, oh, yeah, you're, you're, so you're supposed one. to use this to open doors and That's things right. that you don't it's want to touch. Case. Exactly. It's it called kinda, a touch. It kind of looks like a big skeleton key. Yeah. It's, I love the shape of it. Design-wise, it's very cool. I like the feel of it too, but, and I do use it for opening doors. And when I very first got it, um, I was able to do all of the things that you're supposed to be able to do with it, which is to sign your signature on debit or credit, you know, the little pad that you use, all that kind of stuff, key things in on that pad. Well, what I've noticed, first of all, it took me forever to, it took forever to get to my place. I finally get it. It worked for about two weeks. And then I noticed, and and I don't know if I'm being crazy here. I want you guys to, to weigh in. Um, it stopped working on those screens when the humidity kicked up. And I wonder if there might be a relationship there, but essentially the thing is a joke. (laughs) 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 Luckily I didn't spend much on it, but for anybody who might be thinking about these things, because they're starting to become popular. Um, the truth of the matter is from what I've read, where did I read this? The EPA and the New England Journal of Medicine both said that pure copper, again, this is not pure copper, that micro, the antimicrobial, by, by, what am I trying to say? Microbial. Microbial activity um, happens within two to four hours, but the, um, the EPA says it only works on bacteria. And of course, coronavirus is not a bacteria. So the other bit of it is that you take this thing it could have, you know, anything on it for at least two to four hours. So you stick it in your pocket, right. you pull it back out. I mean, you have to be as conscious with this as you would with a fingertip. And so what's the point in that, right? See, you, you like, be- I'm sure yeah. millions of Americans bought this from a Facebook ad. That's where I saw it, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think that there's any possibility that the reason it's not working as a touch tool is to do with humidity? Because I noticed a direct correlation between the timing. It doesn't work that way anymore. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, because it's like if you touch, 
your iPhone screen when it's when your fingers are wet, the, the little um, auto lock won't you know it won't respond correctly. So, right. uh, um, I guess so. Yeah, I rely. Uh, that's a question for one of our uh, bright listeners. That's uh, a question for probably... Barbara. I'm specifically reaching out to you, Barbara. <laughs> write write into me about the antibacterial properties of brass as an you know versus copper. And humidity, the effect on so. Boy, that's something we should do with greater regularity. Ask Barbara segment, uh, <laughs> you know, right? I just know she's going to write paragraphs. <laughs> I love her; she's the best. Yeah. Uh, so I've been uh, out on the field. I, yeah. I went on a photo shoot for the first time since COVID lockdown, and um, my mom pointed out that anytime I travel somewhere, there's an outbreak. So you know. Uh, <laughs> Are she asked me last sport? night where I'm going to next so she can know where the next outbreak in the country is going to be. <laughs> and we're making light of this, but it is true. Like, so I, I went to Western Pennsylvania and like all of a sudden their caseloads started jumping. I don't know what the heck's going on, but I was on a uh, slate roof shoot and, uh, uh, it was just totally awesome. I had such a great time with Andy Grace and his crew. They were very kind to me. Um, and, I, I want to sh share a little anecdote, but I'll, I'll keep it brief. So, you know, years ago, I decided it wasn't fair to re require our authors to wear, you know, fall arrest systems and me not wear one on the roof. So, you know, for the last couple roof shoots, maybe four or five, I've been wearing a fall arrest system with, uh, you know, a lifeline and a rope grab. And for those of you who don't know, a rope grab is this thing that allows you to, uh, slide along the lifeline with a shorter length of rope. And um, if you pull the cam on it, it allows you to move it along the rope. And the, the secret to using this safely is to, when you're going up and down the roof, you need to pay out enough of the line so you don't get hung up like a dog on a leash when you're stepping like to the uh, roof jacks, uh, the next level up, for example, because they're probably five feet apart, right? So I was coming down the roof and I did not pay enough uh, rope out and the, the rope stopped me and I like, was like this on the, like a turtle on my back. Right. Yeah. And, um, I wasn't going to fall or whatever, but I couldn't get up because there was so much tension on the rope that I couldn't unhook it from my, uh, belt, right. From my harness. And, um, if you guys probably wouldn't be surprised to learn that slate get very hot uh, <laughs> when you're up on the roof, right? And so I'm lying there with my hands out like this, and and and, and my one hand is on on the slate, and I can't take it off. And uh, so one of the guys takes his hat off and he puts it under my hand so I'm not burning myself. And and I was like, I look at this other guy, it's like I can't get this unhitched. And so he un, undoes my my uh, my clip for me so I can stand up again. But they. <laughs> They were just really sweet. And I would tell you folks, if you're wearing a lifeline, just keep this little safety uh, reminder. Uh, it's funny. I've heard people say that the lifelines will kill you. Uh, and the more I use them, the more I kind of believe that. Because <laughs> either you either step on the rope and, you know, you're, it goes out from under you because it's round. Or you have the situation where I did where you're trying to move around and, and you get caught up. Do you think most builders forsake those? I do. I, I very rarely see people wearing them on residential constraints, uh, construction sites. I see people using them on commercial projects because they're made to. Of course, yeah. Uh, and Andy makes his crew wear them, but I can tell you they don't like to. And mm -hmm. it's for the reasons I identified. They're going up and down all the time. It's a hassle. It really mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have actually seen them more more, more on uh, job sites in my area, So, which I, I, I am surprised at. But, you know, in the conversations that we've seen on social media around – our recent article on fall protection, um, you know, there are plenty of guys out there who are like, you know what, I know it's a hassle. I've, I've avoided it in the past, but I care about my people mm -hmm. and I want to keep them safe. Yeah. And if, you know, if the rope, rope makes you fall or trip, you're not going to die. Right. Yeah. But if you fall without the rope, you might, you know, or you could be injured permanently. So, um, yeah. Do it right. It's it's yeah. not easy or pleasant, but it's just something you got to do. And uh, I should tell you guys, you know, the employees here at the McCombstead or the employee has been hard at work uh, today. He is fastening <laughs> deck boards with a uh, screw gun. Does he have and, a good attitude about it, Patrick? Yeah, he really does, Kylie. Um, 
he's sick to death of spreading mulch. Mm-hmm. Um, and I totally get that cause it's not fun and it's, it's been nice. really hot and he mm-hmm. seems especially sensitive to the heat. Um, he always has been, um, he loves the cold weather, but he does not like the heat. So he starts seven thirty in the morning and is done around eleven thirty. <laughs> like his dad. So he's, he's <laughs> <laughs> that's usually about my nap time, Kylie, right? <laughs> so he's doing the deck installation unsupervised right now. Yeah, he is. I gave him a uh, a crash Shock course uh, this morning. I said, you know, I, I showed him that the screws have to go in the center of the joist, and you know, I told him how to snap lines and. Uh, I'm dying to know what's going on out there, but I'm resisting uh, checking, you know. Carol around. Yeah. Well, he, should be eyeballing that. Well, at least we know he's a crafty guy who like mm-hmm. who can make things out of nothing. So, I mean, if he can do all the all his crazy art projects, if he can do those, he should be able to put a couple of boards in straight. He is a budding engineer, no question. You guys want to tell him about the uh, the robo? I was impressed with that Me and too. and I'm I'm so happy to to hear that uh, Carol said that he was looking forward to showing me the video because he oh. knew I knew I'd enjoy it. Yeah. But um, so you uh, should tell folks what we're talking about. Yeah. So so for years, uh, Liam has been making little creatures and robots and models out of whatever he finds lying around, duct tape and and wire and scraps of metal. And uh, but he's definitely got an interest in robotics too. So he built this little ro- animatronic blacksmith. And it's basically, so it's like this motorized box with a shaft coming out of the side that's hooked up to a battery pack. And he built a little anvil out of like, what, a block of wood or something like that. Yeah. And then he's, and then he's got a, uh, he's got like a little toy sword sitting on the anvil taped down. And this robotic device has an arm with a hammer and it just swings and smashes the the sword repeatedly. It's really cool. <laughs> it's really cool. We'll put the little know. video up on the podcast page for those of you who are interested in checking that out. It's definitely worth looking He's at. Very talented and smart. He's pretty easy to get along with too. That's his greatest attribute. <laughs> oh my god! So we got some great saw uh, feedback about sawhorses, and that continues. Uh, I'm going to read uh, Keith's uh, email. He says, Patrick, I was taught by my father and father-in-law that building a quality set of sawhorse is not, is not only a test for a new carpenter, but an investment in learning and building your own tools. I've used many designs in my 30 years of remodeling and building, but I'm very happy with the current design as shown in the attached photos. I'm fortunate not to have to work out of a pickup truck all day, so my horses focus on function and appeal to the carpenter rather than easy storage. All parts are made from salvage one by six. I'm fortunate to have lived near a communications equipment supplier who received racks of equipment on custom built pallets made from one by six number two pine that was screwed together. There isn't an easier pallet to to disassemble and repurpose. The legs splay in two directions based on the inspiration of Tim Killen's article in Fine Woodworking number 189. The assembly is done with type bond number three and brads. They are sturdy enough to support two by lumber and my weight as a scaffold platform. They are my, they're, these are my nice ones for interior work. Note the picture with old socks on the legs to protect the finished floor during a kitchen installation. So this is brilliant. He took yeah. socks and put them on the legs of his sawhorse so it wouldn't scratch the floor. I know. I and like not that. only is it smart, it looks hilarious. <laughs> I love that they're camping socks or something. They're like heavy-duty socks. <laughs> uh, the flat piece on top is screwed on so it can be replaced. It overhangs the subtop to allow clamping with an F body clamp, for instance. When I make these for exterior use, I double up all the members for strength and durability. I've also built two pairs to support our pair of kayaks in the barn. He says, I'm looking forward to reading the article. So I put photographs on these because they are just beautiful, Keith. (laughs) Um, It really demonstrates someone who cares about the craft. Um, I don't know where I'd put him in Ian's uh, treatise on uh, sawhorse uh, users and creators, (laughs) but he's somewhere in between the uh, dreaming about it and um, the practical. Yeah, it's nice there. They've got... They're very elegant and uh, well built, but at the same time, they're made out of rough pallet boards. Mm-hmm. So they've got this nice kind of balance of roughness and refinement to them. You guys are so into this story. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen you talk about I one tell of your you, I was much. less into it yesterday when I was taking pictures for three hours in the studio oh, wearing wow. a freaking mask and oh, dying. Yeah. Um, but 
those of you uh, who who were interested in this, I, I think it's going to be a good good piece. I really do. Mm-hmm. So we heard from my ha- uh, friend Doug Horgan, who works at BOA uh, in the D.C. area. And uh, this is in response to a conversation we had in episode 257 uh, with regard to leaks and closed cell foam insulation. He says, I know the open cell folks like to talk about how their material lets water through so it's safer in roofs, but I've seen a puddle of water on top of open cell foam. This was in an attic where the foam was on the attic floor and a defective sheet of plywood caused a roof leak above. I've seen two relief roof leaks that didn't seem to have much trouble getting through closed cell foam. My conclusion from the admittedly small sample is that the claim was self-serving, wishful marketing talk by the open cell folks. We're using closed cell in roofs. Well, thanks for that, Doug. Uh, those of you who may remember, those of you may not remember, but uh, Doug did a piece on job site protection uh, for the fine home building, and I will put a link to that very good article uh, on the fine home building podcast page because... It is awesome. Hey, you guys, I talked to a builder yesterday who does something that I hadn't heard anybody say before. He uses a skin coat of closed cell spray foam followed by wet packed, these are for the wall assemblies, wet packed cellulose. Is that something that people do regularly? So it's Boy, basically- I've never heard of damp spray with uh, closed cell. So commonly they call it flash and bat. So you put a flash coat of closed cell foam on and then you put a bat in the cavity, right? In the <laughs> Closed cell does the air sealing and the bat, which is way less expensive, does the insulating. Insulating, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that uh, flash and bat stuff, I mean, it, the, the whole point of it is to save money because, I mean, obviously if you're using spray foam, um, it, it's expensive. And, but, the, but the thing is it also adds a lot of complexity and variables to the installation that, uh, you know, what? if you used – What are you one, talking about complexity? Well, I'm just saying you have to have two different – insulation contractors or two at least two different processes happen at two different times but you're using wet spray foam aren't you if you're just way. doing the foam coat? oh yeah, yeah for sure way yeah do you and hear I, much do you hear much about the wet spray uh, cellulose I've, i mean I years ago about. years ago that seemed to be pretty common but i haven't heard about it in a long time i had to have him explain i to do me. happen to know a lot about that i did a photo shoot in brooklyn with a company that was doing it and um they don't like to call it wet spray they call it damp spray um, but it looks like a fantastic, uh, method. I, I've heard some people who are worried about, you know, how long does it take to dry? And, you know, are I've you heard of other people. The cellulose, the wet pack cellulose. Is that what you're talking about? Are you talking yeah. about? Yeah. Okay. The cellulose. Yeah. He said it. Yeah. It took two weeks, I think. So what I <laughs> learned from these folks was that you're supposed to drywall right away because it'll keep oh. on taking moisture on, uh, from the air. So they want you to actually close it up. So I'll put a link to that article on uh, the Fine Home Building podcast page, but it was very interesting. It might have been one of the dirtiest photo shoots I have ever been on. (laughs) And taking flash photography um, in that environment was one of the more challenging photo uh, scenarios because if you guys have ever tried tried to take photographs in a snowstorm with flash, (laughs) you know that the flash reflects off the snowflakes and uh, it makes it very difficult to see the image. And the same thing was happening uh, in this shoot. And the other thing that was happening was, so the installer was using an RF controller to turn the blower on and off. Right. And it also made my strobe lights turn on and off <laughs> unexpectedly. And, uh, that was Sounds like a good time. <laughs> oh my God. People think this is easy. <laughs> uh, this is from Ken in Ringe, New Hampshire. First, thank you, Rob, for reorganizing and re-indexing all the topics on the FHB website. I am guilty of letting my membership and subscriptions lapse off and on over the years, and I've been building and renovating our house. Pre-internet, I had to use the annual index issues that came out and then the website search, but the work that Rob is doing is really important to those of us who depend on FHB for the best answer to a project rather than the hundreds of YouTubers out there who may or may not get it right. Keep going with the web topics reorganization. It really helps us. We have moved houses a few times, so my back issues are packed away in boxes in the cellar, but I did find this box with my 80s issues. Second, Patrick, you're right. Good content is not free, and we all need to support the type of in-depth, technical, and well-written articles your authors do in the magazine. I promise to re-up my membership once I can relocate my wallet and credit card in this massive renovation I'm doing. 
And I'll buy a hoodie or a t-shirt too. Take good care and keep having fun with the podcast. Well, thanks, Ken. Yeah, and thanks for that compliment. I can't take all the credit for sure. I mean, we have a team of people working on this, and I'm just thrilled that I've been given the resources and uh, and the great team that we have to get this done because I've known for years that that uh, a lot of people struggle to find stuff because we have so much good content on the website. It's hard you know, to rely just on a search engine to find that stuff. And uh, it's not a great service to our, our readers that way. I will, rem- I will remind people, and it's kind of buried, and I want to pull some of these features out a little bit easier to find. Hopefully, I'm going to be building a page on the website that's sort of like a, an overview of all your different options on how to access things. But basically, if you go to the little bar, the black bar on the top of the screen on, on our homepage and um, – expand it there is both the archive and the magazine index in there and if you go to the magazine index page there's a search bar that just specifically searches the archive of magazine articles and you can type in any keyword and it searches the body of every single article and it actually works a lot better if you're specifically looking for for magazine articles it works a lot better than than a typical search bar or even a Google search does to find the articles that you're looking for. So. That's Rob, great, Rob. Thanks like, for that. Yeah, awesome. I feel like you're the right person for the job, too, because you've been with Taunton for so long and you know the brand so well and you've got such a wealth of, you know, the articles, you know, you know, where to find everything. I think, it's, I think it's easier to go to you to find stuff. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Internally, I tell everybody to come to me, so I hope I don't become the the global taunt and search engine after this. <laughs> I would tell all our listeners, if you want to find something on the website, contact Rob at any time of day or night. He's willing to help. <laughs> oh my God. So you guys remember our conversation of what is Flexicron? Oh, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. So we actually heard from someone who knows, which mm-hmm. is appreciated. <laughs> this comes from Kent, who's with Thomas and Milliken Millwork in Petoskey, Michigan. Hey, podcast. I recently listened to your discussion about Flexicon finish on Anderson products. Although I'm currently a Marvin only dealer, I've sold Anderson products for 25 years previously and I'm well acquainted with their offerings. The quote cladding question most often comes up these days when a customer comes in our showroom during some comparison shopping. If they've looked at Anderson's product in our market, the 400 series is the go-to. They will offer that person, quoting them, the doors has told them about that the Frenchwood door is vinyl clad and ask if Marvin offers anything similar. I then turn to my trusty Anderson Suites catalog and show them the frame is fiberglass reinforced composite and the panels are protected with a low maintenance urethane base finish. That is paint. He answered um, my question. <laughs> yeah, the 400 series tilt wash windows specify that the wood sash has the Flexicron finish, which is electronic, electrostatically applied. In other words, paint. When Anderson started pre-finishing their products several years ago, it was an easy thing to accomplish as they sprayed both sides of the door panel or sash instead of just one. I have heard sales reps describing the Frenchwood series as clad wood doors, which is technically correct as paint is a cladding. But it can be construed by a homeowner as vinyl, aluminum, or fiberglass cladding, which it most definitely is not. When I show a customer in print how Anderson clads their various products, it is not done to discredit the products that Anderson produces, but to help educate the customer and put them on a path to making a more informed decision. I found it much easier to sell my chosen window and door line, Marvin, by knowing exactly how my competition makes and markets their products. In that role, I am more of a consultant than a salesman. The Anderson product catalog is available for free download on their website for all their lines. I would strongly recommend builders, homeowners, and competing window lines make use of that information. This is true of all the major window companies. Um, The old saying that knowledge is power is absolutely true, and it's, it's the more knowledgeable sales consultant that generally wins the day. I really enjoy the podcast and have been an on and off again subscriber to the publication. I was moved to renew that subscription based on Patrick's PBS plea at the end of the last episode. Keep up the good work, Kent. Kent, thank you. Marvin is lucky to have Kent. I know, he, he's, <laughs> he's very knowledgeable. And, and I would say we are very, too. That's right and honest. This is, this is great. This is from uh, Chris in Charlotte, North Carolina. In episode 261 segment about the huge attached shop, Patrick asked, how do you describe winter in Minnesota? 
<laughs> while living in Duluth, Minnesota, which about as, is about as far north as you can get before hitting Canada, I watched a documentary about early Duluth that called it, quote, a frozen hellscape. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a zone in the building codes, but it sounds about right to me. <laughs> So I have to say something about that. I tried to look that up, and I apparently that that well not that phrase comes up a lot when describing that part of the country. Oh. I found some some Reddit article where someone was asking about whether it compared to Nebraska, and someone said Minnesota is a frozen hellscape devoid of joy from November until March. I'm packing up and moving there. <laughs> I found this yeah. documentary that he referenced. It took a little bit, but uh, I, it's it's queued up. I plan to watch it. <laughs> well, if we have any Minnesota listeners, and I, I suspect we do, uh, you know, it, prove us wrong. Is well, it a frozen hellscape? <laughs> well, the, in that same sentence, though, the the person said, "Winners aren't so bad there because there's hockey and stuff to do." <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Some people like Liam and me love winter. I bet we'd think it's beautiful. So I can tell you I loved winter a lot more in Stowe, Vermont, because <laughs> there's reliable snow for cross-country skiing and, and, and recreating, right? Um, I find I like winter a lot less in southern Connecticut, where it's frozen rain and slush and horrible things. With you. Uh, you know. But that, you know couple winters where we got 120 inches of snow and I decided to save money by uh, canceling my plow contract. I was, didn't <laughs> like it much then. Can't this win. is from uh, Daniel. He says, Patrick, really enjoyed the septic conversation in pro episode 260 with Dr. Eric Severson. Next time he's on, can you ask about methods to rehabilitate a drain field? There's a contractor in my area that offers drain field aeration. I'm not sure of all the details, but they insist it adds decades of life to the system. I would really also appreciate learning more about what kinds of systems have a smaller footprint and or surface discharge. If it helps, we're in Illinois, about 50 miles outside of Chicago. Great episode. I like both podcasts. Helps me get my carpentry slash DIY fix in. Signed, <laughs> wrong career engineer, Daniel. <laughs> I asked Daniel what kind of engineer he was, but he's, he's resisted telling me. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, this has been fun, but we should take some questions before we run out of time here. Uh, this comes from Trip in Spokane, Washington. I'm, ready, I'm wanting to insulate the outside walls in my connected garage, and I have a question about how best to go about sealing them from water, vapor, air. It's a basic slab-on-grade construction with two-by-four studs in the garage. The siding on the outside walls are T111 without any water barrier, etc. It's similar to the insulated portions of my house that have clear plastic directly behind the sheetrock and no barrier other than siding on the outside. So essentially, it has siding, insulation, clear plastic sheeting, and then sheetrock. In the winter, when there is snow on the ground and the wind kicks up, snow comes in through the bottom of the siding and piles up on the floor plates. I was planning on using spray foam to fix the cracks on the bottom and then thinking about insulating and then some, putting some plastic on top of insulation before I put up sheetrock and or OSB in the <laughs> insulation. Is there a better method to deal with this so I'm not trapping moisture in the walls and messing everything up? I prefer not to rip all the siding off and replace it other than a few spots that need to be repaired. Go ahead, Rob. Oh, why do I always get these questions? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, well, he's in Spokane, I think, is in zone five. So I don't think they need the plastic sheeting in there at all. I think they can probably skip that. I mean, that, that's probably just a holdover from when everybody was putting plastic sheet, sheeting in the walls as a vapor We barrier. should tell folks that in all but the coldest places in the country, you don't want plastic <laughs> vapor barriers in your wall because it stops drying. Yeah. I mean, it's basically Canada and a few places along the Canadian border. And that's about it. Uh, because if you're, if you've got moisture coming in and it's, uh, that, that plastic becomes a cold surface in the, in the summertime, when you've got your air conditioner running in there, it's just going to pour water down on the inside of those sill plates. Um, but yeah, so I'm, he's, he can skip the plastic. And I mean, it doesn't sound like a very taxing uh, system there. I mean, uh, he's got to seal up those cracks, though, because oh, if snow sure. is blowing in, you can't have that getting in there and then having the wall full of insulation because it's never going to dry. So yeah, you absolutely have to seal up the cracks so the snow doesn't blow in. Yeah, of course. I mean, spray foam is probably not a horrible way to do it. It wouldn't be a bad idea to maybe put some sort of flashing down there instead or, or in addition to the spray foam. 
uh, especially if well, especially if, if it's a gap at the bottom of the siding. I mean, you, you run the chance of spray foam going outside, and if it's visible at all, obviously you wouldn't want to be seeing that it, or exposing it to UV you know, from the outside because the spray foam certainly doesn't like UV exposure. Um, it looks so. terrible after it gets UV exposure. It turns all brown and, and gets all hard and stuff. Yeah, so, I can't. so like some, you know, some bent aluminum flashing maybe in there first and then tape it or or caulk it in place would be fine too. I like caulking for that particular mm -hmm. transition. It seems to work really well. And I worry, especially when you have thin beads of spray foam, it doesn't seem to uh, maintain a seal to both surfaces very long. It, it inevitably gives up on one side or the other, and then it's not doing its job. Is yeah. it easier to conceal the caulk too? I would think you'd have more control over it. Yeah, I would agree, Kylie. It's especially in like thin gaps. If, yeah. if you have like three eighths of an inch or greater, I think spray foam is awesome. But if you're trying to seal a smaller gap than that, I would say caulk or tape. Caulk is awesome. Tape is even better, but it's also very expensive. Good and, tape. Right. Yeah. So what? and then and then any typical insulation method should be fine in there. I mean, you know, you could use use any kind of bats or or. or or blow in insulation would be fine. I, I love uh, Rockwell bats. I think my next insulating project, I'm going to use those, even though they cost about twice as much. Yeah, I know. Didn't you give me a hard time about that one time, about how spendy they were and why would I bother? I probably did. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick always comes around with me. I don't know. I, I, sometimes I feel like he's just looking for some way to be contrary to us. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> well, so the real question is, will I really pry open my wallet when it comes time? And the answer is probably not, right? Yep. Uh, this is from Craig in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I have a question that would love your input from the expert panel of builders. I don't know who he's talking about. Um, anyway, <laughs> I hope this is the right forum for this. I'm a serial DIYer with above average skills who knows his limitations. My question is, I'm restoring a 1914 home with one by four beveled siding attached directly to the two by four studs. I have a window which I need to board up. How should I address this? Should I sheathe this section and then apply the siding? If so, how does one match the siding to the existing siding? If I do, won't the new? If I put new sheathing, won't the siding be proud of the old siding by the thickness of the sheeting? Thank you in advance for any advice your group is willing to share, Rob. No, so Rob no, you've need... got to do it the way the house is built. And of course, if you put a layer of sheathing there, that's going to be proud of the existing siding. Boom. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so well to, to elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, basically, I mean, I would cut back to the center of the adjacent studs. And if he really wants to do a nice job, he would cut back different courses to different studs. So he yeah, can, he's got to tooth this in, right? He, he can't yeah. have a, lines of siding uh, seams, you know, that were where the original window opening was. I mean, gotta, he, I mean he can. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I think that's a little schlocky, I got to say. <laughs> but yeah, so basically, you know, uh, several every other course cut back to the, a different stud. And uh, you got to kind of weave the new pieces of siding in there and nail them directly to the original studs. And then uh, it'll look like it was always there. Or just cover it with Tyvek and leave it there for five years. That's another <laughs> way to go. <laughs> this is from Ethan and Tyler Hill, PA. Hey, gang. My fiance and I recently are recently about to purchase. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. I'm going to start over again. My fiance and I are about to purchase an 1860s farmhouse in Tyler Hill, PA. We plan on doing a major renovation on the interior and exterior to restore the house back to its full potential. I'm a carpenter, so I'm planning on doing most of the renovation myself. One of the only improvements the seller had done was the installation of blown-in cellulose. After some research, I found a lot of sources that claim insulating old houses' walls is the worst possible thing you can do without proper air sealing de details, which has me worried that we are in for a nightmare. My plan for managing moisture is such. The first task is to bring the basement specialist in to put new interior drains to a sump pit and encapsulate the walls with 20 mil reinforced plastic. This, along with dehumidification, should take care of any basement moisture. Thankfully, the $20,000 scope of work has a lifetime water-free warranty. 
The next big task is to build a new back porch and partially reside the adjoining wall. This wall has the most significant water damage. It, this part of the house was clearly a poorly executed addition. From what I can see, there's no sheathing, the tar paper is damaged, no window or door flashing, and the deck isn't flashed. The water has been pouring in through gaping holes beneath the siding for who knows how long. So all of those leads me to the question, can I simply put on a new WRB, use zip system tapes to flash the windows and doors, build a deck correctly, install new claps, or do I need to remove the cellulose and take a different approach? Also, should we consider removing all the cellulose throughout the entire house? We really didn't budget to redo all the plaster on the interior, so we're hoping that the other walls are not taking on as much moisture and can be left alone. As you can see from photos, the elevation aside from the addition walls appear to be in somewhat better shape. I'm certain that this project will result in at least a bi-weekly question for the FHB podcast crew. Thanks for any help you can provide. Oh, oh. my goodness. Well, Have you, you guys seen what? this house? Yeah, it is adorable. It's house. It is a beautiful little house. So, I love it. It's got some great brackets. Go ahead, Kylie. What are you going to do? Oh, I, I don't know. I just, go ahead, Rob. I just hope he doesn't have to remove all that cellulose. I'm hoping you guys don't say that that's necessary. So, you know, the thing about the problem with cellulose is if it gets wet, wet. on a regular basis. So, obviously, um, if you've got bad flashing, around your windows. You don't want cellulose in your walls. If you can deal with all of the penetrations into the house, it's dense pack cellulose is not a bad thing in an old house. In fact, there, I found a uh, Joe Stebrick article um, called don't be dense <laughs> cellulose and <laughs> dense pack cell insulation. And he talks about how as a retrofit, it's actually a, a pretty decent approach. As long it's as forgiving, you can right? It's yeah, forgiving. As you, it's forgiving. Yeah, as long as you can manage bulk water. So he's smart to be dealing with the basement because you don't want humidity, especially this house probably has balloon framing. So if you've got a wet basement, it's just it's just pouring moisture up into those wall cavities. Um, so if you deal with the basement moisture and make sure that the flashing details are good on windows and doors on the house, uh, dense pack isn't necessarily a bad thing in an old house like that. And you got to control your interior moisture too. Like you got to use bath fans and they have to be effective. You have to use a range hood and it has to be effective. Many folks suggest that you should put your bath fans on a timer to uh, have a good air exchange. And, uh, you know, if your humidity is high, you're going to manage it with uh, dehumidification, either air conditioning or dehumidifiers. You know, like once you uh, stop the drying potential of your now insulated walls with cellulose, you need to make sure you're managing interior sources of moisture. So you're going to have to sell your 100 fish tanks. You're going to have to get rid of your house plants, and you're going to have to uh, dry out the basement, right? Yeah. Yeah, and the thing is, I mean, the, the one caveat is, though, that it, it would be good to try to get a, an idea of how well that cellulose is installed. Because if it, if it is truly filling all the cavities and dense pack, then it actually acts as a pretty good uh, sort of de facto like uh, like hygroscopic air, buffer yeah there you go <laughs> <laughs> and even even at not so bad as an air barrier too i mean it's not a true air barrier but it does slow the passage of it air. does a pretty good job yeah. yeah especially when you're installing it uh in dense pack right it, it, loose fill like in your <clears throat> uh attic uh floor installations is not as good an air barrier as dense packed yep uh don't worry about I mean, you, you just monitor it, right? Like, and, and it's not a bad idea to, you know, drill some holes in places that you suspect are a problem and get yourself a good moisture meter and do some investigation, right? Poke around. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, you're, as, if you, old houses, you just got to keep an eye on the problem areas. And, and it's not that big a deal, especially on a house with wood, wood siding that has probably solid wood or no sheathing to, to you know, pull off a board, Check, check out some places around the sills to make sure they're not rotting out. You know, you just got to poke around and just, just be aware of the condition of the house and check, it, check in on it every once in a while. I would uh, also, you know, he's going to have a chance to see uh, the worst parts of this home when he rebuilds the deck and, and patches the, the rotted uh, parts of siding. And, uh, you know, it goes without saying that the where the paint is 
peeling worst is going to be an indicator of where you have moisture problems. So, you know, that's where you're going to want to start to do your investigation is where you find places with rot or peeling paint because those are obviously good indicators of moisture problems. Yep. It's funny, my my house in Stowe, my neighbor who was the uh, publisher of the local newspaper and a very nice guy, you know, he had his uh, 1860s home um, dense packed uh, because I'm sure his energy bills were crazy, right? And um, But when he did that, he started to have to paint uh, one elevation of his house every two years because all of a sudden it didn't have the drying and now that moisture was coming through the siding and bringing the paint with it uh, every couple years. And he regretted uh, doing that, but I can't imagine uh, it was more expensive to paint that one elevation every couple years than it would have been to spend hundreds of dollars a month on on fuel to heat his drafty old house, right? Yeah, and, and to your point earlier, Patrick, about ma- if you manage the moisture that's getting into those walls, then you're probably not going to see quite as bad a uh, paint problem. But it is true. Any house that has any moisture in the walls that has been filled with uh, especially cellulose insulation, it's, uh, it's pretty common for the paint on the wood clapboards to not last as long. Yeah, That's good to know. How's your paint job doing there, Kylie? Which paint job? On your exterior of your house. I have vinyl siding. I don't have a paint job. Are you talking Isn't about that great? Tr- Isn't that just one great thing to not have to worry about? That was my point. Well, I have a trailer <laughs> that I had redone, and it's interesting. You're talking about peeling paint, and let's see. I had that done two years ago. The slope of the sills was, well, there almost wasn't one. So he added, you know, he pitched it more, um, but they're still starting to peel. So. I just think that my place is so wet, I'm going to have to consistently, you know, every two years probably replace some of my window trim. I got a solution for you. What? PVC. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. You don't it's like it. Well, it's just a, it's more money. Yeah, yeah but if you're going to have to re- like replace all, rotted wood every two years. It, I like the trim color of my house, and I don't want to change that, and it's not every window that needs to be done, so... It's Why can't you paint the PVC the color to, to, what about, to uh, match the trim? Don't they come in limited? Doesn't PVC come in limited colors for that well, application? You can, you can paint it. You, you shouldn't paint it real dark colors, but, you, you know, your trim is off-white. Am I correct? No, it's like a burgundy. Oh, that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> what about some of the uh, other composite trim materials like the fly ash ones? or? That's a good option. Yeah, because that, that stuff is um, – it's made out of a waste product as opposed to being made out of a toxic chemical. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a good alternative to wood and it's, and that stuff lasts forever too. It's really good. It's nice. Just to, to be clear too. for those of you who are listening in the plastics industry, Rob is by no means uh, suggesting <laughs> that PVC is a toxic chemical. <laughs> well, fly ash itself isn't exactly the healthiest thing either. But, uh, it's hard to, I, you know, to- I worry about, so the, the, Folks say that that stuff is not bad for you, but I've been around it when you're cutting it, and I got to believe it's bad for you. Well, just like you're cutting out of anything, I mean, you really should be wearing a respirator yeah. or a good dust mask whenever Very you're true. cutting. Do you guys wear dust masks when you're working with just plain, you know, lumber? I totally do. You know why, Kylie? Because it seems to really screw up my allergies. I have very bad allergies to just about everything, and a pine is really, really screws me up. Yeah, I, I definitely work with a. I definitely use a dust mask with pressure treated, with cedar, with mahogany, anything that has either chemicals or oils in it that irritate the heck out of my throat. And because uh, I wake up the next day with a sore throat if I'm cutting some of that stuff. So I wear a dust mask, uh, well, a respirator when I'm mowing the grass. Do you really? Yeah, I do. Good for you. That's quite an image. Well, and it keeps people from talking to me. That's also another uh, side benefit. I think you should wear a a scuba tank. (laughs) (laughs) With your own air source. (laughs) Don't tempt me. That sounds awesome. (laughs) Oh, my God. So this is my favorite question from the show. I've been saving it till last. Um, This comes from Jesse. And... uh, 
It's good. Your guys are going to like this too. Hey, FHB folks, I'm curious about a career involving building science or design or both. For most of my working life, I've been a carpenter in residential building and remodeling, or I've worked in facilities maintenance. I'm 29 years old and already getting tired of carrying heavy stuff, wearing PPE, constant, wearing PPE constantly, and dealing with the consequences of never wearing PPE. I'll be the first to say that the trades are a fantastic alternative to college, which a lot of folks could find very fulfilling. But I've done my time and I want out. I still want to be creative and work with buildings, but I dream of moving on to an area where I feel like I'm making more of a lasting impact on humanity and moving the stubborn field of construction forward. I'm currently thinking that the best way to start this journey is a college degree, but the only thing I can seem to find is a construction project management degree with only occasional mentions of green building or thoughtful design as filler courses to make you a better project manager. I'm not entirely sure what my dream career would look like, but I assure you it is not project management. So what are my options? How do you, did you all get the jobs you have? They seem fun. Do I need to go to college? Are there degrees I'm not finding that involve more science design? Am I realizing that I actually want to be an architect deep down? I look forward to hopefully hearing from an array of people on the Pro Talk series, Keep It Up, It's Great, who tell stories of nuanced paths into all areas of construction and building science. Maybe some other listeners can give me some advice. Thanks for all you do for the advancement of the trades. Jesse. Wow. Yep. So first off, how did we get our jobs? Rob, let Jeff, okay. you go first. Oh, yeah, go, Jeff. Me? Uh, yeah, you. <laughs> I, I, I actually started out in television and um, wound up working with Colin somewhere else. And when he came to find home building uh, after a few years, he brought me here. How long have and you been what's with the, the adjustment from, you know, you you were in the let's call it the civilian sector. Uh, <laughs> what's it been like moving here to the you know uh, hallowed halls of fine home building? It's, I mean, it's kind of funny because I actually applied for a job here almost thirty years ago. So it's uh, you know it's it's something that's always been on my radar. So. That's cool. And did you enjoy the content before working here? Were oh, you yeah, familiar yeah. with the brand? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I've got my dad's old fine woodworkings from like year two or so. Jeff, how about how you, Rob? You... How'd you luck out with your job? Well, I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I've done a lot of different things over the years. I mean, I was an upholsterer's apprentice. I did antique restoration. I've done metalwork. Uh, and, uh, but I, the job that I, I've done the most for the most years of my life, other than this, is uh, working in residential remodeling. And uh, I was a remodeling carpenter working for uh, another company when um, my wife, Michelle, was working at Fine Gardening. And she was there for 15 years. And um, half of that time was before I was working at Taunton. So, um, And I then always, you came on for GBA, right? Yeah. So basically... She was always keeping an eye out for me, and uh, I actually applied for a print editor job a couple of times. Uh, and, and, and you didn't get it. I, I didn't get out. it. Yeah, and I didn't get it. Uh, well, the thing is, <laughs> here's the thing. I have had, I had no prior writing or editing experience, no formal training in publishing or building science or anything like that. But what I did have is the fact that I was, uh, I had done a lot of craft and trade jobs and as just a very analytical thinker and was passionately, uh, you know, researching building science when it was really becoming like a new popular topic. And uh, I came in and Dan Morrison was running the project of building GBA, at least from the Taunton side of things. And uh, I was like, well, I don't have any formal training in any of this stuff, but here's what I know. Here's what I can do. And I, and he gave me a bunch of, you know, tests on, different things uh, related to my knowledge and my ability to produce, you know, useful information. And he took a chance on me. Hmm. So how about you, Kylie? Well, I love this guy. What he says is I've, I've done my time and I want out. And I had a similar experience. I, my career path has been very serendipitous and 
like upon graduating with a philosophy degree, I was a farm jockey and I got bored after a couple of years of that and wanted to elevate. So I went into horticulture and I went back to school for, I, I, I went to a trade school. It's a UMass Stockbridge school. And I got a degree in landscape construction because I was interested in design and they didn't have a, you either studied horticulture, which was sort of the science plant side of things, or you studied landscape uh, construction. And the reason I did that was because I was then able to take all of these classes in in with the five-year um, students who were studying landscape architecture. So I was getting a really quality education, but I was doing it through, this, through the trade school. Um, it was a great program. So then I went on to be a professional gardener for almost 22 years, but my body was giving out. And by the time I turned 38, I thought I, I need to get out of this. I can't do this until the day I die. Um, so I went and did a certificate. You know, I've always been a strong writer. So I, I went and did a certificate in editing and writing. And that nine month program at the University of Washington um, in Seattle was fantastic. It was such a solid core curriculum. And um, and then I just did everything possible to 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 get published. And I did a lot of things for free. I never said no to anything. I'd worked my tail off and then I wound up getting um, a job with a regional pub, you know, regional magazine. And that led to a lot of other opportunities through editors that I met. And once I landed at United States Green Building Council as a journalist, I felt like I had arrived. And then I met you guys and you let me come on board. And Taunton is just a fantastic place full of heart and you know, rigor. Did you have the uh, the gauntlet interview where they assembled like a dozen people to drill you with questions? No, I got off easy. I had Brian and <laughs> Brian and Justin, and then I had lunch with all of you. <laughs> Did you think like, what well, am I getting I, myself into? This is a separate time. I mean, I was being hired as the design editor, and I wasn't expected to know how to build. And you know, they knew who I was coming in and what my skill set was. And I was hired more as a journalist, obviously, than than anything else. But um, I. I you know, I appreciate where he's coming from. It's not easy to make a career change. You've got to put your time into that portion of it too. You know, my, my story to getting here is really long and I don't want to bore folks with it, but (laughs) you know, I have a communication degree. I decided I did not want to sit in an office when I got out of college. I wanted to be a builder. I had always wanted to be a tradesperson. My mom and dad convinced me to go to college instead of becoming an electrician, which I really wanted to do. And I don't regret any of that. Um, But I certainly understand Jesse's, uh, you know, concerns like trade work will destroy your body. And um, so, you know, I I went to work for Habitat first as a volunteer uh, and then, you know, they hired me as a construction supervisor first part time. And then by the time I left there, I was the director of construction, mainly through attrition, uh, not because of any, you know, special skills I had, but, um, I'd always been pretty handy and have loved home building my whole life. And, uh, When Carol and I moved to Vermont, she decided she wanted to move back to Vermont where she grew up. And, um, I went there to visit and we kind of ended up just staying there. And I got a job at a a lumber yard because I figured I could do that. And, uh, boy, the economy was just booming and they were really short of applicants. So (laughs) despite having no real qualifications to do that, they hired me. And, uh, I did that for a few years and, and liked it well enough. And then we bought a house and it was 60 miles away. So all of a sudden it wasn't practical to be commuting 120 miles each way or every day to go to work. So I took a job at a, the local hardware store for roughly the same amount of money I was making at the lumber yard. And it was a mile away from my house and I loved it. Um, but the guy who owned the place and I started butting heads almost immediately. We just did not get along. Um, and I, I skipped a step here. So the years while I was working in the lumber yard, I met Don Jackson, who at the time was the editor of the Journal of Light Construction. And he asked me a number of times to consider becoming a magazine editor there. And I don't know why he thought I would be good at that, but uh, he did. And And when it was clear that my job at the hardware store was not working out, I called up Don and I said, Hey, are you still looking for a, you know, an editor? I, you know, this is not working out for me. And it seems very interesting. I I have my whole life. I've resisted sitting in an office doing office work, but you know, the appeal of being able to go out to job sites and photograph and deal with builders made it more palatable. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, you know, he gave me a writing test. He sent me, uh, you know, here, here's a package, edit it. Uh, can you submit some tool stories? He's like, I know you're really into tools. Uh, and, uh, he hired me. Um, and I think I would have stayed there a long time, but then the economy tanked in 2008 and, uh, I got, I was laid off and, uh, almost immediately Justin Fink contacted me about doing freelance work. Mm -hmm. And I started doing that for fine home building. And, um, at the time, uh, fine woodworking needed an editor and, uh, they, uh, brought me down from Vermont to do an interview. It is one of the most grueling interviews I've ever had. It was uh, three hours long with three different people. Uh, they asked very hard questions and um, somehow I survived that. And uh, I, I was like not ever into woodworking to be truthful. It's just, the, I don't like the, the fussiness of it, the preciousness of it. And, um, but I was like, well, it's wood. It's, I'm going to learn to love it. <laughs> and I did not. <laughs> and then a job came up at Fine Home Building, and I applied for that. Uh, Brian was the editor at that time. And uh, have, he brought me on board, and I haven't looked back. I, I love my job, and uh, I can't imagine a better thing to do. And it is very fun, Jesse. Um, and I would tell you to try it, you know, like start contributing to magazines if, if you want to yeah. do that. He clearly can write. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's actually a really good point. I was also going to say, Patrick, uh, I was kind of in the same boat as him. I was, I've was i been doing create, craft or trade jobs for half my adult life, uh, and I um, I was feeling, even though I had a college degree, I have a, actually a degree in psychology of all things, um, I had never done a job where I was felt like I was using my degree. So I was like, I felt like I was kind of a failure because I I was I kept changing careers, changing jobs. But what I realized when I finally came to find home building or for GBA originally is that all those years of me doing all those different things had uniquely prepared me for the skills I needed and the knowledge I needed and the analytical thinking that I needed to be a good editor at the magazine. And what I will say is that don't be afraid of those kinds of changes and, and, and be honest with yourself about what you actually bring to the table. A college degree isn't everything. And, and increasingly, it's not even really necessary in a lot of, uh, in a lot of these kinds of moves. Like I, would, I would try to start getting to know people that are um, working in the types of industries he's talking about locally, whether it be solar or energy auditing. A lot of those jobs you can get with um, little to no, you know, with training that, that's not a four-year degree. You know, not, it's, it's still valuable and intense training, and some of it's going to be on the job training. But uh, I would say, you know, definitely, definitely try to just put your feelers out there to see before you start committing to a, an education that might get you somewhere eventually, try to see what your options are. And act, if, if they're because you'd be surprised, a, a lot of people in, in, in jobs where they care about what they're doing and they're doing very technical jobs, the thing they appreciate most is someone who is dedicated and passionate about the work. So even if you don't have the experience, if you're willing to learn, I mean, that uh, Deja on your on your podcast the other day, Patrick was talking about that, how, you know, someone recognized her potential, even though she didn't have the years of experience. Exactly. Well, you know, the, Jesse, the Pro Talk podcast generally is a great place to hear about the circuitous path that nearly all of us have taken to get in this kind of work. The one that we recorded uh, with Rob Delaney, and that's not up yet. Uh, he's a weatherization guy, but, you know, listen to his story. And, you know, he, he, I think that one of the clues that I, I picked up on in your email, Jesse, was lasting impact on humanity. And I think what drew me to my job at Habitat for Humanity was that. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to help poor people have housing because I think it is so important to elevating um, a family's situation. If you're living in, in substandard rental housing or in, 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 in decrepit housing, it really screws up your life. Mm -hmm. And having a house and the transfer of wealth is one of the best ways that people do better in life. It's how they get educated and, you know, it's been demonstrated. And I really wanted to make a difference. You know, I think we should acknowledge the fact that he's interested in design because mm -hmm. 
Uh, that is, you know, he, he questions whether or not he might be a secret architect just waiting to happen. Um, I, I would look into that because an, an architect, if he were to go that route, uh, he's got the building knowledge and, right. and those are golden skills to combine, you know, right. he turns out to be a designer who really like Steve basic, he, you know, somebody who really knows the, the other side of it. It makes you a better architect. Yeah. Uh, you know, it really does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think, you know, all architects should uh, have to have some sort of experience directing the trades, even if it's just summer programs when they're in school. But just because it's, you know, not that any one side of the building equation is better or more knowledgeable or smarter. It's just that if you understand the needs of all the people that you're working with, it's so much easier to give them the resources they need to do their job to the best of their abilities. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I hear people say like, I want to be a writer. I want to be a painter. I want to be a photographer. Well, I say, if you want to do that, do that, write, take pictures, paint. If you want to be a house designer, design houses just fancifully and, and like do it. You know, it's like, you don't get to be a thing without doing it. You know, that I love that. I feel so inspired, (laughs) Patrick. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> it seems so simple, but it's, you know, people like often think that there's this magical path to, to do the thing you want to do. And, and often, and it's awesome. sold often as education, right? And, and that's fine. Mm-hmm. But like, may, imagine if you took the four years you spent le- getting your degree and just put it into learning the thing you want to do, uh, even if it's free. At least you're not paying for college, right? It, uh, you know, I say learn on the job. And that I, I've always learned the most by doing. That's true. But sometimes you need a certificate and a license. Sure, but that may not be the first step. Sure. So, like, right. I think, you know, Dip your toes dabble, dabble in what, it, what, you're, what, you're, what you're interested in. Get to know people in that field. I mean, the thing is, if you're passionate about something and you find like-minded people, mm-hmm. you'd be surprised at how much faster you're going to learn than if you're just stuck in a classroom somewhere. And then when you do go, if you do choose to do a degree or some other training, you'll be better prepared mentally to absorb what you can learn in that training. And he would be, if he were to take that route, I think that's great advice. You know, he, I think as a mature student, when you go back to school, like Matt and I did, I just feel like you get so much more out of it because you're there as a, you know, you're really committed at that point. And you're a grown up, you know. Grown-up, exactly. <laughs> Unfortunately, you're typically among non grown ups. <laughs> <laughs> That must be challenging at times. <laughs> and, and you know they're all looking at you like, why is that old lady in here? Right? Yeah, yeah. I, was only, I was the only woman. Yeah, two years with those guys. <laughs> uh, I'm hoping listeners will weigh in with advice for Jesse because oftentimes, you know, our best information comes from folks who listen to this wacky podcast. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, I think they probably have more to offer than we do. I, I feel very blessed for my job. And you're not getting it, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, I'd love to hear more stories about other people's past. Because I know that's the thing is we're, we're so conditioned to think that there's like this narrow, straight path to getting from point A to point B. But most people never take that path. I think that's changing, too. I think that's of years ago when people would choose a career and then be in it until the day they retired. Oh, mm-hmm. I think for companies just generation. don't do that anymore. There's no loyalty with employees. Like, you know, you used to go work for IBM and then you retire with the gold watch and right. then you're retired. But, you know, I don't know. A lot of people at Taunton have been there for decades. There's some, in, there's some loyalty. It's a, if you wind up with a good company. I think Taunton is exceptional. I really do. I don't think that that's the norm. No, you're right. Jeff, what do you say? Yeah, I, 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 you know, it's definitely true that things are not the way they used to be. And, and the idea of going, you know, changing careers is a, a lot easier than it used to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't be, be scared. Don't be I mean, and if you start doing something and you don't like it, do something else. God, you spent so much of your t- time working in your life. I would hate to hate my job. Yeah. Well, and you said, Patrick, if you do something you don't like, you can always change again. That, like, think about it. How many fine home building editors have gone back and forth to trade jobs yeah. in there, like multiple times? I think 
like 75% of the fine home building editors have done that probably, mm -hmm. right? Andy Engel works here every few years, right? He's like, Does <laughs> <laughs> he ever really leave, though? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Oh, my goodness. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Thanks to Kylie, Rob, and Jeff for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to like, comment, or review us however you're listening to the podcast. It helps other folks find it. And please be safe, happy building, and enjoy your job. <laughs>